Hello, I'm Peter Ndora. Welcome to this week's edition of Health Talk. Now, coming up on the programme, producer Wendelin Mufukeng spoke to a woman about her experience with COVID-19 and the drive to advocate uh, breaking down the stigma of uh, this virus. And we also get the facts about the safety of administering oxygen at home for patients who've contracted COVID-19. And that's from the Director of Critical Care at Wits University. Then we speak to Dr. Marlin Mackay. I'm sure you remember him. He's our usual GP. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, ivermectin. And that has been lauded as a miracle treatment for COVID-19. One of these uh, therapeutics that uh, some doctors, uh, I've got to tell you, are saying that uh, we should be thinking about. And then finally, we get advice from one of the regular doctors, as I said, uh, Dr. Mackay, uh, to talk to us about uh, some of the questions that you've been putting on social media. And we think that it's important that you get a proper answer for some of your questions. Right, let's start, though, with uh, our usual slot, and that's uh, hearing from our senior producer, Zama Butelezi, who'll take us through the latest South African COVID-19 numbers. Zama... Good to see you as always. And uh, it looks like in some parts, I saw Western Cape in particular, that perhaps they've gone through the peak in terms of these numbers. Yes, it looks like we mm. are approaching uh, the, the peak mm. of this pandemic. A very good morning to you, Peter, and our health talk viewers. But globally, COVID numbers continue to increase. To date, more than 96 million people have been infected. More than 53 million people have recovered. But sadly, more than 2 million died from illnesses related to COVID-19. South Africa is now the 16th worst affected country globally in terms of coronavirus cases and leading in the African continent. But for now, let's take a look at the national COVID-19 statistics. More than 7.8 million tests have been processed in South Africa. More than 1.3 million positive cases recorded. More than 1.1 people have recovered. More than 150,000 active cases recorded. More than 39,000 people have died from COVID-related illnesses. Looking at the infections in the provinces, the numbers of new infections are on the increase in four of the nine provinces still reporting the highest numbers of infections. And these are provinces with big metros. Gauteng is still the epicenter of this pandemic and experts say these numbers are set to increase in the coming weeks in this province. Government, as a result, has halted the opening of schools to curb the spread of the virus. For now, let's take a look at where these provinces are. More than 370,000 positive cases recorded in Gauteng, more than 290,000 positive cases recorded in Guazulu Natal, more than 260,000 positive cases recorded in the Western Cape, more than 180,000 positive cases recorded in the Eastern Cape. The following provinces were recording the lowest numbers before the festive season and these increased sharply as many were visiting these provinces. Let's take a look at where they are. More than 70,000 positive cases recorded in the Free State, more than 56,000 positive cases recorded in Pumalanga, more than 53,000 positive cases recorded in the Northwest, more than 51,000 positive cases recorded in Limpopo, more than 30,000 positive cases recorded in the Northern Cape. Sad news, on Thursday, South Africa woke up to the news that Minister in the Presidency, Jackson Mtembu, passed on from COVID-related complications. According to reports, Minister Mtembu tested positive for COVID early this month. Our thoughts are with his family, friends and colleagues at this time of loss. We are in the second wave of this pandemic and this wave arrived with a new variant which is more transmissible, spreading faster, triggering more hospitalizations, further straining the health care resources. So we are all urged to continue to take precautionary measures and these include regularly washing our hands with soap and water, sanitize using sanitizers containing 70% alcohol content. We must also continue to wear our cloth mask that covers both our nose and mouth in public. We must continue to practice social distancing and ensure proper ventilation indoors as more people are now back at work. 
If you believe there is a chance you may be infected with the virus, call ahead to seek medical help from your healthcare provider or use the public hotline 0800-029-999 and alert them to your symptoms. Be safe. Thank you very much. And back to you, Peter. Thanks so much indeed, Zama. And I think the story uh, that uh, continues to come through is that we must remain vigilant. Even if we go past the peak, and these vaccines are on the way, but it's still going to take some time, isn't it? It is still going to take some time, and we are all urged, if you mm. contract this virus, to go and seek medical help, to go to the hospitals. I know there are so many stories going around, but I think you're better off going there to seek medical yeah. help than just staying at home. Go early. Thanks so much, Zama. Thank you. All right, so those are the statistics, but uh, don't forget that uh, as we observe and report on uh, COVID-19 cases, the numbers can change and sometimes they do significantly as, as you've been seeing over the past year. So uh, just please bear that in mind. Okay, don't forget you can also be part of the show. Uh, if you want to ask our guests some questions or maybe you just want to comment on some of the things that uh, you hear uh, that we'll be discussing, the number to call is uh, Johannesburg 011-714-5861 or 7145877. We look forward to hearing from you. You can also catch us on social media and share your thoughts with us there. Uh, our Twitter handle is at SABC Health Talk or hashtag SABC Health Talk. And you can also uh, um, post on Facebook. Our, our, our first Facebook page is SABC Health Talk. And the program continues right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Health Talk now. We need to, uh, to uh, break COVID-19 stigma. We, we need to make sure that people feel comfortable and that COVID-19 testing, uh, it shouldn't be done in shame or in fear. Now, those are some of the words of Rachel Vardy, who's from KwaZulu-Natal, who recently tested positive for COVID-19. She sat down with uh, producer Wandile Mofokeng to talk about her experience with COVID-19 and advocating to break the stigma with regards to this virus. Rachel, uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us your time and uh, welcome to Health Talk. Thank you so much for having me on, on the show to talk about something that's so important. Just kindly tell us uh, what prompted you to go out and get tested for COVID-19. Well, I've been having a heavy cough for a while and um, it was just getting progressively worse. While I had no other symptoms, I decided, no, let me just go and test for peace of mind as to what's happening. Just kindly also tell us about the experience. How was the treatment? How was the process of testing? Was it smooth or were there too many people there? How was the process of uh, testing? And what type of mm. could you do? So this was a drive-through at a sports field in Phoenix at the Rhinoville grounds. And there must have been about, <clears throat> I would say about 50 cars in the line waiting to go through. So we had to follow the line. So along the grounds, all the cars were parked one behind the, the other. <coughs> and we had to wait for our turn. Um, it was good because it felt like it was still in an open environment and um, it felt safe because I did not feel like I was around people that could have been positive. And um, <clears throat> so when you roll up and it's your turn, <coughs> the nurse comes to your window and there's this really long earbud kind of um, yeah, instrument that she uses. And she asks you to lift your head up and she puts it in through your nose. <clears throat> and within a few seconds, it's out. Now, how long or how soon did you get your results and what was uh, the outcome of the results? I received my results a day later and it was positive. Um, when you get that message, I had a very 
kind nurse call me and um, explain my results and tell me and walk me through it. And she was so sweet and so nice and very comforting and kept checking up on how I'm doing, um, how I'm feeling. So her, her, the way in which she handled um, breaking the news to me was very comforting. After receiving your, your results, um, were you told that you need to isolate or were you also told that you need to be on some form of treatment immediately? What was explained to you or what was the process after getting your results? Absolutely. The nurse said to me, I need to go into immediate isolation. She actually asked me if I, if I started isolating and I said yes. They made me aware of what medication I need to take. They did also advise me that I could go and see a doctor if I wanted, who would prescribe medication for me. But she had made me aware of the, <coughs> of the vitamins um, that I needed to take in order to combat this virus. I can't help but notice that you are coughing. Could you just kindly tell us about the symptoms that you are experiencing right now and what form of treatment are you on? <coughs> so I'm actually on day 20 since I tested positive. And according to what medical experts are saying, by day 14, you should be um, you should be on your way to recovery. But what I've noticed is there's been a serious sense of um, post some post COVID symptoms. And that's what I'm referring it to. It seems like <clears throat> even though you are now tested clear and you don't have traces of the virus that you can transmit, your body is still reacting to what the virus did to it. Literally, when the virus enters your body, it butchers you in every way. Your breathing capacity <clears throat> really uh, drops. <coughs> As you can hear, yeah, I am still coughing and it's still a hectic cough. And even speaking to you, the, the exertion of it is taking a strain on my throat. I'm constantly drinking water because you still battle to breathe. Your lungs are affected in such a way that it takes time for you to heal. So the cough is still there, the nasal drip is still there, <clears throat> and the fatigue, you get so, so tired. It's, it's absolutely not funny. With regards to the vaccine, what do you think of the vaccine and would you take the vaccine when it's available here in South Africa? And the way I feel, if I'm going to die and this is something that is going to save me, yes, I will take it. I will take whatever I need to take in order to get better and beat this virus. <clears throat> Absolutely, I will take the vaccine. Now, after the break, we discuss the safety of administering oxygen at home for patients who've contracted COVID-19. We speak to uh, a professor of critical care at uh, Wits University. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Health Talk. Now, innovative solutions are required to effectively address the unprecedented surge of demand on our healthcare systems created uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the World Health Organization, many people with COVID-19 develop mild or uncomplicated illness. And not everyone actually develops severe disease that requires hospitalization or admission to an intensive care unit or requires a ventilator. As the current COVID-19 inpatient strategy relies on managing oxygenation, uh, could, be, uh, could selected patients be discharged at home if uh, oxygen administration at home could be addressed in a safe way? Can home treatment and monitoring of patients who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic be implemented to uh, ameliorate the health system's burden whilst maintaining 
uh, the safety and effectiveness of care. Well, today we have uh, Professor Guy Richards uh, to join us to shed some light on this important topic with regards to critical care. Thanks so much indeed for joining us, Prof. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Peter. All right, before we get into the uh, uh, treatment, let's talk a little bit about the second wave and uh, what you make of uh, uh, what's been happening. Um, was it expected? I suppose some people might say yes, given what we've seen in other parts of the world. Well, I think that is the case. I must be honest, I had been hoping that it would affect primarily areas that had not been uh, involved to any extent before. Um, but in fact, it seems to have been across the board that we've been seeing large numbers uh, more, in fact, than in the first wave. And that really follows the same pattern as that which has been seen uh, in Europe and in the United States. And it really has placed an enormous burden on healthcare services in the country. I know it's difficult to uh, assess fully, but I guess this variant has contributed as well at the pace of infection. Well, that's correct. It seems that it enhances transmission. Um, it seems that it is more infective, but not necessarily more virulent. That hasn't been uh, confirmed, and it actually appears probably that it isn't. Of course, the one problem about the variant is, could this also mean that those people that have had it are no longer as immune as they were before? Mm. Having said that, when we look at the stats that were presented the other night, 4,300 reinfections out of 1.2 million positives, that's uh, a very low number. And that probably correlates with the vaccine efficacy, which shows about 90 to 94 percent efficacy, depending on which vaccine you're actually looking at. All right. In terms of, uh, you talk of, about uh, virulence, uh, is symptoms, are they similar to uh, the first strain, the original strain, uh, when they present? Yes, they are. Um, and in fact, you need to look at this disease as having three phases. In the first phase, this is in patients who are symptomatic. Remember, a large number of people are entirely asymptomatic and are unaware that they ever had the disease. So if we take the symptomatic people, those who have symptoms, then we would say that 80% of those will have mild cold-like symptoms fatigue and uh, maybe a bit of a temperature and a blocked nose and a sore throat and a cough, and that's as far as they go. About 20% of, of the patients go on to what we call a pneumonic phase, a phase in which they develop lung involvement in terms of a pneumonia, a viral pneumonia specifically. That's the vast majority of people who are admitted. And a very small group of patients go on to what we call a hyperinflammatory response, where there are other organs that are involved, including the heart and the kidneys and the blood and all sorts of other manifestations there as well. So those that develop the uh, pneumonic phase also have varying degrees of illness within that phase. And of course, uh, that would determine whether you require oxygen and how much you require and how it should be administered. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, uh, this oxygen story because uh, that's become quite a thing in terms of uh, shortages that are being experienced and uh, its administration and uh, whether everybody needs it. What is the story in terms of why oxygen becomes necessary? Explain the pathology and the, and the, the disease process. Well, pneumonia means that the small little air sacs within the lungs become inflamed. And when they become inflamed, they are no longer able to transfer oxygen from the lungs into the blood. And then you become hypoxemic, which means that your oxygen levels are low. Those low oxygen levels then would make you increase your rate at which you breathe and would sometimes in severe cases make you look blue in your tongue and the tips of your fingers being unable to uh, to measure or to, to move that oxygen from the lungs into the vascular compartment. So then how does uh, oxygenation work? Is it, I mean, isn't your body still having to uh, move the oxygen around uh, at the body? Yeah, well, <clears throat> we talk about oxygen delivery to the tissues. Mm. And you need a number of factors that are going to be important in terms of oxygen delivery. The first of those is hemoglobin, because your red cells 
The hemoglobin in the red cells is what carries the oxygen in the bloodstream. The second is that you need to have it pumped around the body. So you actually need the heart to pump it around the body and to uh, ensure that it gets to the peripheries and wherever it needs to go in the body itself. But the third thing that you actually need is a certain amount of oxygen that is being supplied by the lungs. So if any one of those parameters is decreased, you're going to get decreased oxygen delivery going to the tissues and to the peripheral uh, areas of your body. And that means that the lung is a critical component in terms of ensuring that you have sufficient carrying capacity of oxygen uh, in the blood. So more and more we're seeing people buying oxygen uh, for home use. And I suppose uh, one needs to make sure and know and understand that uh, you, the circumstances you use it under and um, the amounts required. And I just wonder, is, is it something that you recommend, home oxygenation, or uh, what are your thoughts? Well, anybody who has low oxygen levels, and the only way that you can really assess that is by using an oximeter. You can get them from the pharmacy, but they're about a thousand rand or thereabouts for an, an oximeter. So not everybody will be able to afford one. And that's a little device which goes on the finger and measures what your oxygen levels are like in the blood. And if that is low, you should really be assessed initially at a hospital to see whether in fact you need admission and to see again how much oxygen you require and also to assess uh, whether you need it to be delivered by specific machines such as CPAP machines or high flow machines or even a mechanical ventilator. So <clears throat> patients who have low oxygen levels may well require to go to hospital first and most people do not have access to the eximeter so again, if they are feeling short of breath, would need to go to the hospital to see whether their oxygen levels actually are decreased or not. Because using oxygen, if your oxygen levels are not decreased, is not helpful and may be harmful. All right, let's talk a little bit about oxygen and the amounts. Is it possible to get too much uh, and, and sit on this machine for too long? Not if you are hypoxemic, not if your mm. oxygen levels actually are low. So if they are low, you would then require oxygen. Initially, the first phase of delivery of oxygen is just with a nasal cannula. That's the two little prongs that you place in the nose, and they then will deliver up to five liters of oxygen per minute. And uh, that would be adequate for the majority of people that actually have hypoxemia. But thereafter, you may well need to go on to other devices that we would have in hospital and would facilitate the higher levels of oxygen to be administered and in different manners, in a different manner as well. Giving oxygen in too high a level can be harmful because we know that uh, oxygen uh, can in fact cause uh, the formation of what we call oxygen-free radicals and those themselves can be harmful to the lungs. But that generally is not a, a problem so long as you are monitoring what your oxygen levels actually are. All right, so your best advice is, yes, um, oxygen at home is not necessarily a bad thing, but there must be at least some medical advice in the process. Yes, and some measure of how low your oxygen levels actually are, and do you actually require it? The previous young lady uh, mentioned that, um, she, uh, that the lungs are uh, damaged and that you become, uh, and that you have low oxygen levels. Very often, in fact, in patients who've had relatively mild disease, the lungs are not damaged. When you, we measure their function, they actually are normal, but you have a sensation of having inadequate oxygenation. You have the sensation which makes you feel short of breath. And those patients do not require oxygen. So it is important to actually measure whether in fact it is low or not. Are you concerned about uh, the types of oxygen machines that are out there and are being bought for home use? I would imagine not, not all of them uh, meet the requirements of treating COVID-19 types of symptoms. So I think that the two major devices that are utilized out there are cylinders 
uh, but they are fairly rapidly depleted, but they don't require electricity. Then you've got the oxygen concentrators, and those are the ones that remove nitrogen from the air and are able to deliver up to five or six liters per minute of oxygen, which has been uh, purified and is a um, um, is pure oxygen that is being uh, administered. Of course, those ones are more expensive, and they are also uh, susceptible to load shedding. So if your um, electricity stops, your oxygen may well stop as well. Some of them have a battery which has a certain degree of uh, life in them, um, but uh, if not, your oxygen supply would immediately stop. So that obviously is, is a concern. It's very seldom that anybody would be using any of the other devices like the high flow oxygen or CPAP machines uh, both because of lack of expertise and using them and lack of sufficient oxygen supply to be able to use those in the home. All right. There's this issue, of course, of some people continue to smoke and uh, perhaps family members uh, are exposed to smoke. In a context like this, just explain to us again um, the dangers perhaps of having smoke in an environment where somebody's uh, desperately requiring oxygen. Well, I think that the biggest uh, initial problem is that uh, oxygen, whereas it itself is not combustible, it enhances any combustion that happens to take place. So if you do have a, a, a fire which is initiated, that will uh, dramatically be accelerated by the presence of oxygen. Fires utilize oxygen as well. An additional factor is that cigarette smoke binds to the hemoglobin, which is the a component of the red cell that, that carries oxygen and forms carboxyhemoglobin. And carboxyhemoglobin is no longer able to carry oxygen. So if you're exposed to a lot of uh, smoke, you may well decrease your oxygen carrying capacity when you are already compromised by the amount of oxygen that is being delivered to the, from the lungs to the blood supply. All right, so perhaps finally we're seeing in other countries where oxygen is running out. Are we at that point yet or are we still having adequate supply uh, from your observations? Well, it depends where you are. Mm. In the large uh, hospitals, we have machines that are able to produce large amounts of oxygen. We have on occasion had a, a problem, but those have been augmented in terms of the ability to provide oxygen. Uh, in some of the field hospitals, there have been uh, major problems in terms of the delivery, but those, in fact, have been, uh, be, are being and have been corrected in many circumstances that the large machines are actually available uh, to provide um, uh, uh, adequate amounts where they actually are required. But I'm certain there are some areas that are still deficient in terms of their uh, ability. All right. Professor Guy Richards, thank you so much indeed for joining us and uh, uh, sharing your insights with us on the programme. Thanks for your time. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. That's uh, Professor Guy Richards, uh, who's with uh, uh, Wits University uh, teaching critical care, uh, talking to us about uh, the use of oxygen, uh, particularly at home. And I think the overarching message is make sure that medical advice is a part of that story. Now, after the break, we continue with our discussion and uh, we take a look at uh, ivermectin that has uh, been lauded as a miracle treatment by some for COVID-19. And we speak to uh, Dr. Uh, Marlon Mackay about that and get his thoughts. Welcome back. You're still watching Health Talk. Now, those pushing to have uh, ivermectin, uh, a veterinary drug that has been described as a miracle cure by some for COVID-19 approved for distribution to the general public, will have to wait a little longer to get their wish. The South African Health Products Regulatory Authority says that more clinical trials must be conducted before it can be satisfied that the drug is safe and effective to treat COVID-19. While acknowledging recent studies that have shown positive results of ivermectin in treating COVID-19 patients, the South African Health Products Authority says the information is still inconclusive. 
in the study, what they found was that there is a trend, um, you know, a positive trend in terms of the uh, what we call the viral clearance, um, faster time for viral clearance, shorter duration um, of, of hospitalization. But um, this, this was a positive trend that was identified. However, in the study, he indicates very clearly that there were some gaps with the clinical trials that were conducted in that they were small in size, so it's not um, you know, easy for us to reach a conclusion uh, based on this data. In the meantime, the regulator says doctors who want to prescribe the drug to patients must first apply to it for special permission. We've had instances you know, in the past wherein there has been what we call Section 21, which is basically an emergency use uh, type of authorization that you would give for the, to, for the use of topical evamectin for the treatment of you know, those individuals that have scabies or head lice. So we've made this drug available for other indications, even though it's not registered. The evamectin interest group, a lobby group of local doctors that are pro-evamectin, says it's prepared to work with the authorities to get the drug approved in the country. Our hope is that we can get some of the academic centers in the country uh, to, to participate in this and then uh, make the proper application as any clinical trial is normally done in this country, uh, both from a regulatory perspective and from an ethics perspective. Currently, Evermectin is registered for treatment of animals only. The health products regulator says possession of the drug for any other purpose remains illegal. The regulator has announced that a Pakistani businessman has been apprehended at King Shaga International Airport trying to bring over 2,000 Evermectin tablets into the country. However, it could not provide details of how the so-called bust came about and whether or not a police docket has been opened. So, as the country continues to grapple with COVID-19 and uh, no cure seems to be in the pipeline, many have resorted to untested, unlicensed medicines and other therapeutics to treat the illness. And one of these treatments is ivermectin, as you've just seen. Hailed as a revolutionary drug in the 1980s, which works uh, by paralyzing and killing parasites, including lice and worms in livestock, has been gaining some traction as a miracle cure for COVID-19 patients on social media. Healthcare workers, including doctors, uh, some doctors, I must say, are lobbying for the use of uh, ivermectin. And this includes a political party, the NFP, who's pushing government to procure the ivermectin drug and roll it out to citizens as treatment whilst the vaccine is being awaited. Well, to talk to us a little bit more about that, I'm now joined by Dr. Marlon McKay, who's a general practitioner. Um, thanks so much indeed for joining. It's always good to talk to you. Um, ivermectin. I mean, I, I remember a Senate hearing in the US in December, and one of the doctors that was quoted said, miracle drug. A lot of people have been trying drugs. So we had that hydroxychloroquine story as well play out. Um, and I suppose some of it was an anecdotal. But what are your thoughts? Let's start at the beginning. This was used for animals, wasn't it? Yes, uh, Peter. So ivermectin is a, it's an antiparasitic drug. Most of the evidence that we have is uh, from in vitro studies which is really done, studies that are done in the laboratory situation. It's used in animals and it's been for a long time. The, the problem really comes down to regulation, okay? Mm -hmm. Not enough studies have been done under this situation to see if it's safe and effective. It's not registered. And the problem with social media, it's been touted as a miracle cure, a miracle cure. And there is no cure for, for, for COVID-19 as we speak. And of course, there are not enough studies. In fact, when, many of the studies are small studies. Another important factor, Peter, is that ivermectin has been used. It is always used with steroids. So which is the one that really works? Is it the steroids or is it the ivermectin? That's a confounder. 
So until the WHO has approved the drug for COVID, or until SAPRA, our regulatory authority, has approved it, I don't think it should be used in patients. Now, it may turn out that it works very well, but we have to make sure that we are protecting our patients by ensuring that the drugs that we are using have been proven to be safe and effective. So what are some of these doctors that are calling for its use seeing? Because, you know, we as lay people will hear from someone who's studied medicine for five, six years and maybe even specialised, saying, let's use this drug. So, so what they're essentially seeing is a reduction in the viral load. So when patients get severely ill, it's because of the multiplication of the virus, and so the viral load um, goes up quite substantially. And so that, that correlates with severe illness. And so what they are seeing, as they claim, is that there is a major reduction in viral load, and with that, a, a clinical improvement in the condition of, of patients. And I can understand the anxiety around it because we have limited drugs that are available. At this point in time, oxygen is the major thing and, and corticosteroids are the major modality of treatment. And so it, it can get very emotional because we cling to anything that can work. And, and this is why it's getting like alpha that is a so-called miracle drug for, for COVID. But we have to be very, very careful because we don't have the big studies that can work in a large population of patients. And I suppose uh, the danger, as you say, is that it's used with steroids. So one doesn't know which part of that mix is the one that's doing the improvement. Uh, has it been used at all without steroids? Do you know? No, no. As far as I know, Peter, it has not been used. And and this is for me is the major is the major factor. Because most patients, the first thing that we do, besides all the vitamins and everything that we put there and the blood thinners, thinners um, corticosteroids are probably the mainstay to prevent hypoxia and harm to the lungs. And then these other drugs are, are added. And so the data is very, very short where ivermectin, perhaps, or any one of these so-called miracle drugs have been used as what you call monotherapy without, without corticosteroids. And that, for me, is the major, is the major confounder. And, and this is why we're pushing, where are the studies that can that unequivocally, unambiguously unambiguously, show and prove that ivermectin is the actual active drug that can, that can um, heal or improve patients' conditions. Has ivermectin been used in humans before COVID-19 and for what? Before COVID-19, yeah, so it's used as an as a, a, um, antiparasitic, mostly, top, mostly what you call topically, as the, as the lady was saying early on. In other words, applied to, to the skin or to the body for certain parasitic infections. But it's been used off-label for a number of other parasitic, uh, parasitic infections. So it's been around, it's been labeled and regulated under that. But as I said, most of the, the studies are all in humans, uh, sorry, in animals and in lab situation in vitro studies so the, the data is very very scanty on on humans be it for COVID or any other other illnesses and what sort of side effects because uh, most drugs will have some side effects have been noted with ivermectin over the years yeah so 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 a lot of the the the, the side effects can be um neurological gastro gastrointestinal um, but sometimes with the side effects, it is also very difficult because COVID-19 can affect so many, so many organs. And then, of course, the argument will be the benefits outweigh, the benefits of the treatment outweigh the risks or the side effects because the patients do get better. So it ranges from the, the headache, the nausea, the vomiting, uh, uh, diarrhea, skin rashes and all sorts of things. But again, there's a lot of overlap with the, with the actual COVID infection. All right, so the bottom line is just that not enough is known. It may be true that it works. Yes, who knows? You know, maybe by the time we, we have another discussion next week or the next few weeks, it would have been approved. So things can change, and we as doctors, we, uh, we will accept that. But until now, we must be guided by the science, and we have to try and put emotions uh, uh, one side and wait until it's been properly, properly regulated and, and, and properly approved for use.
All right, not enough evidence. I mean, this, this sounds very <laughs> much like the hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, scenario where there was anecdotal evidence, some doctors really singing its praises, but there just wasn't enough evidence to get it across the line. Absolutely, and, and who knows how much harm was done by, by doctors willy-nilly handing it out. And, it's, and the same thing with some of these antibiotics. It's, it's almost a standard script. And yet, in retrospect now, the data is very, very clear that those drugs have no value in the management of COVID-19. And so we don't want to make this, to repeat the same mistake. So let's be patient. We have treatment, treatments that are available. So it's not like we're doing nothing. It's not like there are no drugs. And let's just be patient until the data is absolutely clear so that it can be used. And I guess a warning to... Uh people at home because nowadays you can buy almost anything online and you don't even know if you're getting the right drug there. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and um, you know, we're living in the day where, where, where unfortunately it's easier to portray a lie than the truth. It's, e it's, it's very, very difficult for us as doctors to, to give honest well, we're giving the honest answers, but we find it very challenging for patients to believe us when we say, listen, let's stick to the science, here's the proof, and yet we have a powerful social, social media platform that, platform that portray these drugs as things that work. And, and it's all, as you mentioned earlier, it's really anecdotal data and anecdotal evidence. So we have to be very, very circumspect with it. All right, okay, and that's where we'll leave it for the time being. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll uh, uh, start our regular feature looking at some of the questions that uh, COVID-19 uh, patients and symptomatic patients are dealing with, and hopefully you've got some answers for us. Stay with us. Okay, that's uh, Dr. Marlon Mackay. We're going to talk to him again after the break, and uh, this time we'll be taking a look at some of the questions that you have been posting on social media and of course the danger is anyone will answer you and uh, probably not a doctor so we're going to get a doctor to address some of those questions that you've posed to get some sound advice stay with us for that Welcome back. You're still watching Health Talk. Yeah, you know that the vaccines are on the way, but they're still quite a way away for most of us. So in the meantime, we've got to do the right things, the right protocols and that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, people are looking at this time for help and advice, particularly in dealing with some of these symptoms. And what we're finding is that people are going online, onto social media, and asking questions and perhaps not always getting the best answers from people who just not qualified to give any answers at all. So we like on this program to uh, get the word from a proper doctor to give you some advice on some of the things that uh, you've been putting out there. And uh, we're rejoined once again by Dr. Marlon Mackay uh, about that. Okay, let's uh, get straight into the first question from Le Tu who says, hello everyone, my mom has been coughing nonstop since last October. Nothing is helping, doctors and hospitals is there someone, anyone with a similar problem and how did they get through it? Any remedies uh, you can recommend? Constant coughing since October. Yeah, so I have, I've had a few of those patients as well, Peter, and it's a very, very difficult one. And I think it's, it's important to, to look for a few things. We know that uh, there's, there's this condition called long-haul COVID or long COVID where you have persistent symptoms so covered all right okay In, all right okay looks like Sorry, so this, this ah, you, you're back we'd lost you for a second so i don't know if you could just repeat your okay. answer so sure. i'm sorry we yeah. have no power here so i'm running on the generator yeah. um we know that there's this condition called long-haul COVID, mm. where you can have persistent symptoms long after you've recovered. And the important thing to make sure, what, what is the lung function like? Are you still able to have full lung capacity? What are your sinuses looking like? Is it not a post-nasal drip that's contributing to the cough? Sometimes acid reflux can cause a dry, persistent, irritating cough. Sometimes some of the vitamins that you may be on can cause that. Is the associated shortness of breath so it needs a full assessment by a doctor to have a look at that. 
rather than just looking at uh, uh, um, some preparations of, of pills and stuff. And please avoid cough mixtures at all costs. Um, and so I would look at the lung function. Maybe is it a form of asthma, acid flux, and the post nasal growth. And if you look down one of those lines, you'll find the answer. All right. So, okay, let's uh, get Faith, uh, who's in Gauteng. Uh, she's on the line. Faith, thanks very much for joining us. What's your question for uh, Dr. Uh, Mackay? Blessings to you and Dr. Peter. I just wanted to find out from Dr. I've had COVID um, nine months ago when it just started. And up till now, I still cannot smell or taste. Okay. And I have lots of side effects with, from, from after having COVID. Okay. All right. Listen on your television. Uh, you, here's your answer. Marlon? You're putting pressure on me, Peter. I don't really have an answer. Mm. I must admit, it's probably one of the longest uh, um, instances or cases where someone has lost their taste, taste and smell for this long. Yeah. Um, most of the patients that I've seen, usually up to about three or four months is the longest, and then they get back. What I suggest is, and here is where I would recommend Google, there are a number of, of smell stimulation tests that you can do. So you need to retrain your brain and your nose and your tongue to start recognizing certain smells and tastes. Yeah. So there are paid tests that one can get off the internet and different smells and, and things that you can taste to relearn and to reprogram uh, everything. And that would be my question. In our, quest, in our conversations that we've had, um, one of the things that I'm starting to understand is that everybody's case is individual. Um, duration, intensity, and that no one size fits all. Absolutely, Peter. And the problem is we just don't have the data. We work on data, so we, we collate all these instances and all these patients who have these different duration and different types of symptoms we do a study and we see what is the commonality and how we can focus. So being such a, a new illness, we just don't have data, enough data. And this is why I can't even honestly give a, a proper answer to that. Because at the end of the day, and I'm not uh, uh, afraid to admit it, to say that we just don't know. Mm. Hopefully we will know in the, near, in the near future or not too distant future. But that's just how this COVID works. All right. Uh, Nobasiga says, uh, uh, hi, I'm on quarantine and my antibiotics are finished. The flu symptoms and taste buds are still a problem. Should I worry? The person I spoke to said that after 10 days, all will be fine. Uh, it, uh, it, it looks like I'll be fine uh, as I'm on my eighth day and I don't have medication. What can I do onwards? Please help. Okay, so I have a, a, a problem. First problem I have with this question, number one, uh, the person should never, should never have been given antibiotics because this is a viral infection. Number two, the, the timeline, Peter, this 10 days, so-called 10 days, is merely for isolation with regard to infectiousness. In other words, after 10 days, the person will no longer be infectious, cannot pass it on, but that doesn't mean that you are better. It doesn't mean that the symptoms are gone. And my recommendation here is that you should still have been given time loads of vitamins. So vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D, magnesium, blood thinners, anti-inflammatories, painkillers, and, and a pulse oximeter to enable you to go through that to minimize the symptoms. An antibiotic doesn't do that. The vitamins help tremendously. So please don't have the expectation that by day 10 I'm going to be better. That just means you can't pass it on, but you may still have symptoms that will persist, as we've seen with so many of our, our viewers. All right, and the last question from Swakai. Uh, please help, I have an 11-month-old that's tested positive. Is there anything we can do? So, so we know that the data shows that the, the, the little ones get a very mild illness because they have so few ACE2 receptors. So uh, the main thing is to monitor. Monitor for fever, monitor the breathing. Usually we just recommend a, 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 a multivitamin syrup and something to manage any pain or fever. And just watch for deterioration. Keep up with fluids, keep up with the eating, and they usually recover quite nicely without any major complications. All right, Dr. Marlon McKay, always good talking to you. Thanks so much indeed. Take care.
Thank you, Peter. Bye-bye. All right, so that's uh, one of our regular uh, doctors, Dr. Marlon McKay, uh, sharing his thoughts of some of your questions that you've been getting. So please be careful about uh, getting advice on the internet, especially from people that are not medical professionals. All right, thanks so much indeed uh, for joining us. Our guests were great as usual. Uh, don't forget, uh, the only way to manage this pandemic is if we all play safe and protect each other. Stay at home social distance, wash your hands, sanitize surfaces, and always wear your masks. I'm Peter Ndoro. See you next week. Bye-bye.